in this session, we will be hearing from uh, Johnny Le Mercier and Juliette Pibas. Um, Johnny is a French artist who primarily works with light projections in space, exploring our perceptions and manipulating our sense of reality through uh, geometry, physics, patterns, and minimalist forms. Some of you might know him as also the co-founder of the visual label Anti-VJ, uh, which he co-founded in 2008. But since 2010, he's been focused on gallery and installation work, um, which we'll be hearing about today, and uh, running his studio, uh, Studio Johnny Le Mercier, um, of which Juliette is the head. Um, and she works very closely with Johnny to develop their uh, ongoing experiments in light projections, um, and also in realizing and touring these ambitious works. Um, but Juliette is also a very talented art producer and curator who works with uh, an amazing roster of international artists uh, in touring and, and staging their works at various festivals and, and events. Um, and she's also been associate curator uh, at various festivals, most recently at the Stripe Festival in Eindhoven. So please welcome them to the stage, um, Johnny and Juliette. Hello. Hey. Um, thanks for the great introduction, Julia. Uh, it's very nice to be uh, to be back here. Uh, we've been sort of uh, coming regularly to show some projects, and it's always a, a great pleasure to see, to see so many uh, friendly faces. And uh, we're gonna try to um, to sort of sum up and, and show what we've been doing for uh, a bit more than a, than a decade. Uh, so the the whole presentation might feel a little bit um, intense. There's a lot to show. We've uh, we've tried to um, to of course not show everything, but uh, apologies if it's a little bit intense. But uh, um, we'll have 15 minutes at the end to uh, to like discuss uh, specific uh, things and projects. Um, uh, like as, as Julia already introduced, um, what we do. Um, I'm going to skip the first slides and I'll do. Um, I'll show you how it how it started. It was basically in my uh, bedroom. I was doing uh, VJing at the time, so uh, working in uh, doing projections in clubs in uh, in Bristol in the UK where I used to live. And one day I made this sort of discovery um, that I could use a video projector not to project a, a rectangular image, but actually to light up uh, something. It's called projection mapping. I haven't invented it, uh, of course, but um, but yeah, that day I realized I wanted to 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 do this. Um, um, and uh, and I started sort of expanding the idea by always using like very simple geometric shapes. Uh, folded paper is very convenient to make some experiments on a budget. And then I started using creative coding tools to make some sort of um, uh, like audio reactive projection and and to sort of animate it. Uh, but it was very much experimental. I was using Flash at the time, but yeah, that this is sort of how I how I started. Probably the first um, uh, significant project that was shown in Club Tra at Club Transmedial in Berlin, 2007. Um, and then I kept doing these uh, sort of experiments. Here is, um, oh yeah, by the way, there's a lot of light that is competing with the light of the brightness of the projector. So you're probably gonna miss like 50% of, of what we're showing. Uh, so on the left, I'm sort of drawing on the wall with paint and then using light to animate uh, the canvas. As Julia uh, explained, I co-founded NTVJ. We did a lot of installations here at Mapping Festival with uh, other visual artists uh, we were, that I was working with. We also started doing, using the same technique of projection mapping, but instead of doing paper origamis, we started doing projections on uh, architecture, facades, and uh, in public space as well. So it's not no longer just sort of limited to a club environment, um, but you're sort of showing the work to a much wider audience. And then you ask yourself questions about um, do, what do I do about this architecture? Um, and I think projection mapping is it's very interesting if you sort of uh, do a project sort of in collaboration with the canvas you're projecting on. Uh, it's no longer just a neutral screen. Uh, we had a chance to project in uh, uh, cathedrals and uh, on uh, sort of um, uh, industrial architecture 
uh, like here, our first um, uh, project in uh, Montreal for Mutech in 2009. And actually projecting on, on the Tour des Convoyeurs is here has a meaning. And then we started doing a lot of research about uh, the architecture itself, its story, uh, maybe people who worked around this architecture in the old port of, of Montreal. So with projection mapping comes um, a lot of question about the, the essence of your work and the things you want to tell, and you sort of develop a language around architecture and geometry. Um, this is way too dark, so um, I'm going to skip that one. Where? Uh, We need, we need both microphones to work together at the same time. Uh, can you see anything, people in the room? Yeah, okay. So, so, but can you like guess? Okay, because from here we see nothing. <laughs> if there's a spare mic, uh, that could be uh, very convenient. Uh, so yeah, anyway, you sort of see a little bit of the Tour des Convoyeurs here with a sort of super tanker. Um, but same, so my point is that working with light and projection mapping and architecture, you really have to sort of think about the narratives and sort of develop um, uh, narratives outside the, the, the club context. So that was a great uh, sort of exercise. Um, jumping far in time, this is sort of same idea of using um, uh, the architecture as a canvas, but this was for Art Basel Miami a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's very interesting to see how our work as visual artists can actually maybe fit uh, also within the art market and the, the art galleries, and it doesn't have to be sort of constrained to uh, 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 festivals, but I think there's a, a huge potential for a lot of um, different places. I'm going to skip a lot. So I did a lot of stage designs. Uh, it's very fun to do, to sort of, well, we know that looking at someone like a performer on stage uh, playing music from a laptop is not really exciting. You basically see uh, an Apple logo and someone doing stuff. So uh, that's why a lot of visual artists got a lot of work uh, to do stage design, to uh, bring light and structures. And so we did a couple of, um, of these. This was for uh, Nuit Sonore in France. Another project we did for Flying Lotus at the Roundhouse in London um, to also sort of develop an aesthetic, develop a visual world to support um, the music uh, and, and the performer. Uh, these projects are very challenging. Uh, most of those stage designs are meant to go on tour. Uh, so it means six month, months plus of work and, and it's, uh, it's, very, it's actually quite difficult, but there are gr great projects around. Um, and what, I guess what we do mostly right now um, is more like installations, uh, which are medium or large scale projects uh, that we do in uh, various contexts from museums to, to festivals and um, Juliet uh, is going to tell us a lot of uh, uh, so the secrets behind we, the, the we're project. Gonna go a little bit, a, a tiny bit in depth uh, on two projects. Um, the first one is Blueprints. And what we want to share about this project is how we manage to unfold the project through time, scale, and various contexts. Um, the idea with this project that was commissioned in 2015 by uh, Stripe Biennale was to try to stop doing one-off. So uh, as Joanie showed, a lot of these um, really impressive video mapping, uh, it was like weeks and months of work for a one night show, which is really exciting, but also very frustrating. So the first um, version of, of Blueprint was made for this incredible warehouse in Eindhoven that used to be the Philip, Philip factory. Um, and um, every project starts with uh, sketching and doing a storyboard or like very raw ideas. Um, but very quickly, like it's really parallel work to focus on the content and the story you want to tell, as well as the tech. Um, what what technology are we going to use for this specific project? And uh, something specific to Blueprints is that this project would not have been possible or would have at least taken another, taken another shape if at the time Elliot Wood uh, had not found this amazing uh, projector hack. So you take a, a compact uh, projector, you hack it, and uh, you double the brightness. You lose the color, but with Joanie aesthetic, it was, I mean, it was part of the constraints, so also part of how the content was developed. 
Uh, so then you start working on the floor plan and how you're going to um, unfold your project in space because, as you see, this is one of the many, many iterations and versions of floor plans that were made during the process. And you get to the point where you, you know you're going to have this monolith in the middle and these two front screens. And then Joanny will uh, work on an anamorphosis that you can get from a sweet spot with the, the video on the monolith and on, on, on the two front screens. Um, so it's to us this project is a really good example how it's really uh, working in parallel between the, the content, the story, and the tech, and doing a lot of back and forth, which is like the the, the biggest struggle of, of a project like that. Um, so the top left shows you a little bit of this anamorphosis um, uh, trick. Uh, that is used on some of the of the content of this 15 minutes uh, piece. But we said no more one-off, or so we try. Um, so only a few weeks after Stripe happened, a Sonar Festival came to us and they wanted to they wanted us to show a stage performance, but we didn't have any stage performance like on time and given the budget. So we decided to to try um, having Blueprint as a stage performance. And on the same year, this festival in Paris came to us asking for uh, an installation for this really beautiful church. And then again, for example, this project was possible in this church because we were using compact projectors because the rigging points were very weak. So with like really big barco or Christie, it would not have been possible. And they also had this amazing tiling uh, that allowed Joanny to readapt blueprints to make it feel in situ and really uh, work with the space without st starting a project from scratch. So it was like using the content of the monolith on the monolith screen and then working on this very simple pattern for the floor. So that's how over just one year, and we kept showing Blueprint over the years, we went from this to that. And uh, we've also shown it as, as a screening, and it works when it's really big scale. We showed it at Mutex San Francisco uh, two years ago. And, um, and yeah, this is a, a, a good case study um, we like to show. It's not always uh, working that we do a project, and, and sometimes we, we don't manage to make it not a one-off, but we really try. Um, the second project we want to tell you about is this um, Barney's New York uh, holiday windows we did uh, a couple of years ago. So it was actually the design of three of their windows on Fifth um, Avenue uh, during uh, Christmas. Uh, one of the window was made with uh, Kyle McDonald, but we want to focus on the second window that was made with uh, Boris Edelstein from uh, Mad Mapper and Modulate and Mapping Festival. So Joanie invited the different artists to collaborate on each of the window. Um, I, I need to say that uh, Julia helped us uh, producing this one. Um, so again, a project starts with ideas like mood boards or sketches. And then quickly, you have to move to the, the tech part. So that's the first cinema for these structures that Joanie was just playing with, with also to um, create a discussion with Boris. That was the, the, one of the main challenge of this ambitious project, having to, have to produce three windows with three different team of people and, and being in constant conversation with them. Uh, then they developed more the structure and came this idea that they wanted to play with mirrors, one-way mirrors, and maybe LEDs somewhere. And the next step was um, making this, okay, this is the the scale of the window, and this is the structure, and we have a super detailed 3D plan, and, and getting there, because this project um, was the first time we, we were uh, building things, like in the real world, like physical objects. And with the development of, of the softwares, now you get to this illusion that you get this structure, everything you can go around, you can even apply realistic texture, you press a button and ta-da, it's in the real world. But we got stuck at this stage because the builders of the project could not build this structure, but we could not understand why they could not build it. So we started having this impossible discussions about angles and, and, and the physicality of a structure, the weight, the, the, the um, tensions. And, and we almost canceled this project because we were getting so close to the deadline and we didn't find any solution. 
One night we, we, we told Kyle McDonald, who we were working with on this other window, that we got stuck. And he had an intuition. Up to this day, we still don't really know what was the code he made. But he came back to us with these um, lines of codes that were ma making an infinite possibilities of structures that would actually be feasible. So I guess he applied constraints of the, the, the size of the LED strips we would embed in the angles and the, the, the impossible angles, like inward angles that were not possible to be built. And thanks to Kyle and, and some like coding and magic, this happened. So, but it was just like the beginning of the construction and, and, and all of this was again very new to us that how do you uh, divide a structure with your uh, LED connectors and, and, and is it DMX world or something like that? Yeah, a lot of DMX. And uh, as again, back and forth to being creative, you, you built a, a you have to build a small prototype, uh, really mini scale to, to see what is your content gonna look like? So this is the this size, and applying this one-way mirror and LEDs, and trying to see okay, this type of animation works, this type of animation doesn't, and then all of these uh, windows had to have uh, custom sound design. But uh, how do you allow the sound designer to create the sound when there's no um, result until the end. So you create a custom software to give a preview just to allow the sound designer, talented sound designer, Thomas Vaquier, who's always the last to come on a project and, and able to work, to create his sound with like this um, a preview of what the content is gonna look like. And this is what you get at the end. So this uh, beautiful window on, on uh, New York Fifth Avenue uh, for a couple of weeks. This project in particular um, works in very, it's sort of at night in low light. So uh, if, if you want to understand anything about this, I think it, it, you won't on, on this projection. But yeah, the, the very interesting point is as a visual artist working with software, we tend to be a little bit disconnected with reality. Uh, something you make in, in a software cannot necessarily be built in, in, for real. So I think we should really realize how much uh, technology sometimes really takes us away from the real world. And I think that applies to a lot of subtopics and, and things. But, um, uh, and I sort of feel like after so many years working with projectors in clubs, in like dark environments and theater, and then um, uh, traveling from one place to the next, I feel more and more sort of disconnect, disconnected with reality. Uh, this is sort of where I, I spent uh, most of my time. Like this is a cave in Manchester, uh, at Manchester University. And it's a multi-display uh, device where you have proje projections everywhere on the floor, on the ceiling. You can put 3D glasses, there's which, amazing tracking. Which is also supposed to be the dream when you wanna work with projection and create worlds. So we would spend, this is uh, my friend Kyle, and we would spend um, uh, days and nights uh, in this area. And I think it, it, it's a good um, example on, of, on how we really get away from the real world. And, and I think at that point, after this residency, which was great, by the way, it was, uh, we were invited by Elliot Woods, and it was very, very nice. But um, you, you can sort of see here, all screens are blue because there's a, there was a crash. The, the 10 computer crashed and then everything is mayhem and then you don't really understand what's going on. And I think it was a good uh, sort of um, moment for me to realize that maybe I should slow down a bit on the code, screen, social network, you name it. And maybe I should try to um, uh, get outside uh, and like do other things. Uh, also to get inspiration, to not just be stuck with uh, nice looking triangles flickering, but try to get a, uh, maybe some more meaning in my work and some more um, uh, essence. Um, it's hard to name, it it's always sounds a bit, a bit cliche. But it started, I guess, when I started taking all these pictures through the, the plane window, and then I was really obsessed by these textures. Uh, so I, I started, instead of just flying over beautiful uh, places, I started uh, doing like treks and, and uh, hiking. Every time I would go in a different uh, country, I would try to extend a little bit my stay to just go outside the city and, uh, and like climb the Mount Fuji. Uh, that was like a unique experience and was, I wouldn't say like um, uh, life changing because it does sound cliche, but when you, when you find yourself in these landscapes, 
when you look around and when you start just not checking your phone and your notifications, but you just like walk for a few hours. Um, I think not talking uh, for several days is also an experience that sort of <laughs> reconnects you a little bit with, with yourself. I would always take a couple of things with me, uh, some fireworks and uh, a GoPro and, and some batteries and, you know, like stuff to maybe do a project or improvise something. I, had, I would have a bottle of water which clearly wasn't enough water for this trip in the in the Death Valley. Um, so I started getting a little bit more organized as I was tra traveling and doing more of these hikes. And uh, last year I did uh, four or five weeks um, in the southwest of the US. So I would take uh, with me like sol solar panels, uh, a lot of batteries to sort of be, uh, be able to sort of sustain or like see if I could even uh, consider like sustain and uh, I had a little drone to uh, to 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 take um, images and maybe start a project or just document the thing. This is a selfie of the drone, um, and so I spent yeah these these five weeks uh, just going through all these uh, all these states, um, and then so uh, I I sort of discovered the sublime, which is this art um, uh, movement. Uh, uh, where this, uh, the idea is to try to capture this amazing landscape, this, the, the scale of, of the nature that we can't really put words in. We, we sort of, we can measure a mountain, but when you're in front of it, you, you, you really don't understand what's going on. It, it, there's a sort of spiritual aspect. So anyway, the sublime is this uh, aesthetic current, um, and, um, and that, that was an inspiration for me uh, to try to sort of, try to capture this, this nature and maybe use this in, in my work somehow. So on this trip, I went with a little robot, a little uh, plotter machine on the left. So I could use different um, techniques to, uh, to, 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 to tell the, the little plotter to, to draw. Uh, so I could be in the wild, but also like produce some drawings and some work and some things that will later become projects. Um, I was lucky enough to spend uh, two days and two nights at the Rodan Crater, uh, the project from James Terrell. Um, I was just outside because the project is not finished, it's not ready and no guests are allowed. So I was just uh, at the gate, but it was still quite amazing. Like the quality of the air and the, the moonlight here, you can actually see two shadows, one from the moon and one from the light of Venus. And it's the, the sky is so clear because we are away from, uh, from cities that you get this kind of weird spiritual experiences that are hard to put words onto. Uh, in the Mojave, Mojave Desert, uh, I found this sort of um, uh, volcanic, volcanic tunnel um, where if you throw uh, dust in the air, then you can see the beams of light, uh, which it's what I've been working on for maybe 12 or, or 13 years. And I'm in the middle of nowhere and maybe I learn more about, uh, about light and yeah. And this then uh so that's that's an interesting example about something we've been saying more and more about how technology is a medium and and how we also want to get out of this ghetto of you know being labeled as just what we do being with technology because when you look at this picture there is like zero technology involved and you can see obvious connections with what Joanne has been trying to explore for the past years so it's just uh, sunlight and dust this is all it takes when you don't have a like a video projector and a fog machine so i guess what i want to try do now and in the future is sort of think more about um uh, this like spiritual ideas again it sounds a bit cliche but i discovered pantheism which is a an idea from spinoza uh, where maybe um, uh, the idea of god maybe it's not a person in in up there like judging humans but maybe uh, nature and god could be something uh, that may, might be the, the same thing so i like this idea of considering the nature and the world and maybe what we call reality as uh, as something we could uh, uh, start engaging in conversations and um it's weird to talk about this on the stage. It's sort of new to me, so it's it's strange. But uh, when you're in front of such uh, a geological feature in New Mexico, um, it, it really sort of triggers something uh, that I can't put words onto yet. That's why I do uh, visual art and not like word art because I, I'm really bad at it. Uh, so now coming back to the the studio's uh, work and to um, how um, artists in the past are, are sort of trying to capture nature and capture this idea of sublime. 
Caspar uh, David Friedrich, uh, the romantic painter, uh, is obviously a, a great inspiration because using his own medium, he was exploring the very same topic, trying to capture how you feel as a human being, like looking at looking at in this nature and. Um, uh, so yeah, a classical painting is, I think, could be a huge inspiration uh, with, also within the sort of tech world and digital world as well. So we're gonna show you um, a few examples of like attempts to capture nature. We still <laughs> repeat this as a like new mantra. Uh, so using simple code, more complex code, drawings, 360 videos. It was like kind of weird to categorize, and keeping this in mind. Um, this was not staged, but it, it was uh, um, in 2014, I think, when Joanie was um, using this uh, 368 GoPro rig to uh, film nature, to, to make this uh, NAMB work that we did in uh, SAT in Montreal. Uh, so that's like you have a 360 panorama, you, you just try to record 360 with cameras and at the time with the softwares not being ready for like stitch, stitching and camera movement, it was really a struggle. Um, I don't know if this just has a little landscape. So uh, considering the time we have, I'm gonna skip through really quickly ar around uh, all these uh, attempts to, to capture those feelings. Uh, so all those are um, barely visible uh, textures that are from pictures I've taken and this is a kind of a, a mood board or inspiration uh, to start. So using code, uh, the very basic approach to sort of recreate nature uh, is using like uh, Perlin noise functions or noise functions in general. It's basically a couple of lines of codes that create those textures and, and then you can uh, use a grid and create mountains from this, this code. And I guess the, the relationship between this formula and the real, the real mountains, I think there's something very interesting here. So Perlin noise mountains is being used a lot in video games or CGI industry, and, uh, and that's what I used to, uh, to do this series of prints, where I sort of fine-tuned a single formula uh, to generate an infinity of, of landscapes. Uh, so, so this is just a very small selection of, uh, of those works, but what I loved was the fine-tuning of that function. So at the beginning it looked really basic and boring, and the more I would uh, fine-tune, the, the, the more like, the details will emerge. And when you do this, you sort of feel a little bit like, uh, like a creator, like a god, because you create your, mo your own mountains and your, your, your own um, uh, worlds, and there's something uh, quite interesting. You sort of feel like you could find the secrets of uh, of the universe, um, uh, it's, it's a bit of a joke, but there's a sense of, of exploration uh, that I liked. And what's interesting about very simple code used to do generative landscape is like you can generate an infinity of landscapes and each of these print is unique and you can have endless discussions with Joanny on why he prefers this one because there's a weird crater and why this one he finds boring and it, it, it brings this thing of trying to understand what, e, what e, why and what fascinates you in nature. Uh, we had this uh, commission project that um, kind of forced us to, um, to exper experiment on more like realistic CGI landscapes and, um, and it led Joanny to uh, learn a little, bit, a, bit, a little bit of world machine software and Octane which was re really new to him and to get to this aesthetics that maybe we don't even know if we like them but it it, it it was part of this project and and it also led us to this type of of uh, new renderings new aesthetic like oh my god there's colors like what what do we do with that and and finding it like weirdly interesting to be able to generate so real uh, images and this is just with code uh, there's no like texture involved, it's, it's mostly like generative, iterative ways of producing these. So it means this sort of relationship between the code and, and the nature, that's something definitely to explore and that's what I like exploring. Uh, we can't yeah, see much. Yeah, this doesn't work. So but on the left is a, a, a photograph and on the right is like a world machine and octane. So you have to believe us, it looks very similar. Um, <laughs> but yet, after this exploration of doing like super realistic world, I feel like I was missing, it still looked like CGI. So there was no sort of emotion, or I was missing something. So I didn't stop my, my research there and, and went back to, uh, 
to like the sketchbook, which is often where we start projects and when the idea sort of come out of your head onto, into reality, so often with sketchbooks. So I started this during the, the hikes uh, at night or in the evening. I would, uh, I would try to sort of uh, doodle and, and see what comes out, up. And then um, all these weird sort of textures and geometries um, emerge. And I wouldn't get that from generative software um, because there's no... The rules that I make to, to, to make these are really sort of intuitive. Um, so, so that's what I like about drawing. And once I understand what rules work, what, uh, what idea actually helps me to capture that, that emotion I had, then I, I use a little robot, uh, the same plotter that you saw before. Uh, and then I could iterate a lot. There's, uh, in, in this exploration of landscape, I like the idea of uh, finding a formula and iterate over and over and over again. That's where, I guess, computers can be very uh, useful. Uh, because they just iterate for you and you pick up the best results, you fine tune and you iterate again. So uh, this series that would have taken me probably a, a couple of years to make, I, make, I made 350 drawings um, last year. And what's interesting about collaborating with a robot is also the, the collaborative part, even if it's not the perfect well, it's still a machine, but uh, what comes out in terms of artifacts, imperfections, uh, like the pen um, running out of ink, or like the little motor that, that lifts the pen that breaks, and then you have this really detailed drawing that is made of a single line. All this is also part of the creative process. Uh, if we wanted it to be perfect, we would just use like fine art print and, and press on the button. Yeah. And using a, as you said, like using a plotter also helps you to really quickly change the type of ink, the type of pen, the type of paper, and then all these happy accidents are, are, arrive. Like uh, here on this drawing, you can't really see, but there's a lot of weird crossings which happen when the the motor broke. And then I started a new series just on like what happens if the motor is broken and what aesthetic you can find and develop and and explore. And this is only possible with a robot because otherwise I wouldn't have had the idea. Um, so yeah, the collaboration I think is, is an interesting uh, term. Uh, another attempt to uh, capture and share th those uh, emotions around the sublime is to do installations. Uh, we haven't invented anything about the, 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 the format. Like I'm very much inspired by the work of Sol Lewitt and his idea to do wall drawing, to basically go outside of the painting frame. Instead of the hanging a painting on the wall, you just get rid of the, the canvas and the room is your canvas. So this has been uh, highly inspiring to start a series of drawing on walls with a layer of light, a layer of projection. Um, so this piece is about the Eyjafjallajökull, the, um, Iceland, the Icelandic volcano that erupted uh, in 2010. And then we sort of developed narratives um, with, with the projection. So the drawing is fixed and then the light helps you sort of tell a story and explore uh, some ideas. Um, this piece is about m the Mount Fuji and is inspired by uh, an old tale, popular tale from the 10th century, I think, and the story of Kaguya Hime. Uh, so it's also interesting to be sort of inspired by the po popular cult culture and, and by uh, other artists to sort of bring uh, a new technology just to bring sort of a new perspective or a new vision on, on things that are uh, timeless. So I these guess. two installations are using uh, wall drawings, so we draw lines that are mapped on a, on a wall. And uh, as in previous examples we've shared with you, at one point we wanted to push the level of detail and that's how we ended up using the um, wallpaper technique. So it takes a lot of uh, complex work to uh, build um, a wallpaper landscape like that. Um, and we hope you can understand that when we show these images, it brings us back to the wanderer above the sea of cloud and Joanie being immersed within the landscapes and how we want to bring the audience, the visitor, and, and give them this similar sensation to be looking at uh, a landscape. So this is another uh, landscape uh, installation that Joanie made after he explored these uh, CGI landscapes. So it's also kind of new and maybe a, a, a road we're gonna develop or maybe not to go with, with more like texture. And, and there is this idea that mathematically speaking, 
the prob there's prob a high probability that this landscape may exist somewhere in the universe, and it becomes really interesting when you push it to be very realistic um, and like teleport people in front of, of this imaginary landscape. So after all these attempts of uh, capturing the sublime, um, I realized that each of them was sort of interesting somehow, but I could never sort of recreate those emotions. So I'm on a never ending journey, I guess. And that brings me back to the definition of uh, the sublime, uh, because the sublime is in aesthetics, it's the quality of greatness beyond all possibility of calculation, measurement or imitation. Uh, and now I realize what it means when I try to imitate and to replicate and, and like, I guess, Caspar Friedrich with uh, amazing skills at painting also, well, on the same journey, and I think there's no way, uh, as the definition says. So I think it's going to be a long, long research, and, and uh, yeah, never ending, I guess, is, is probably what I found out uh, with all these projects. So something happened two years and a half ago. We got, uh, after traveling a lot and being very much on the road with a laptop computer and going from one project to the next, we um, landed in Brussels, uh, in Belgium, where we got a really large studio space. And um, having space and a lot of space really changed uh, our practice and the way uh, we prototype, ex experiment, um, built things, uh, do uh, moldings with porcelain or concrete, and also allowed us to test content full scale instead of like working on content on, on a couple of screens and then arrive on site and realize that the camera movement is too fast or things are like not enoughly detailed. We, we had this, uh, now we have this uh, two meters by six meters uh, wall where we can st test full scale. Uh, having a space also helps to build stuff and to, um, as, as Juliette said, like experiments with material, with like fabrication, and, and maybe to sort of get my hands onto like real things, not just a keyboard and a mouse. Um, so I was um, uh, lucky enough to uh, do this small collaboration with my mom, who's into porcelain. Uh, so she uh, made some molds and helped me to sort of replicate this installation that was made maybe 10 years ago, that you saw at the beginning with like big cubes of, uh, of wood. And uh, exploring on a smaller scale with different material helps you to, to also uh, understand a lot of things. This is glass. Uh, it's so much more exciting as a projection screen or a projection surface than just screens. And this is like a collection of the, of the works um, I've, I've, been, I've been producing. Uh, these are, we call them like uh, gallery works. These pieces are made to be put on a, hung on a wall and maybe sold to uh, uh, art collectors and shown in art fairs. And um, on Thursday, I think I'm going to explore more, do a, a master class to explain this move from the club scene into the, the, the art market. That's a weird gap, but um, hopefully I'll but we don't. More. Unfortunately, we don't have the answers for like how to be Spoiler. successful in the art market. So just come and learn and talk with us, but we don't have the solutions. Yeah. Uh, so after making a lot of physical objects, I also realized that I needed space to make intangible works um, because I couldn't do these experiments very much when I was in uh, um, uh, planes and, uh, and, or hotels. So this is a very simple anamorphosis actually that I did uh, seven, uh, in 2007. So it's a projection on a, of, a, of a picture in, inside a plate. And what I liked about this experiment is like when you look at it from a certain angle, you can't really tell what's there. You can't really tell if the plate is pink or if the color is real or not. You can't really tell what's going on with the reflection. And that's um, something I wanted to explore more. Um, and then this is what I did in the studio. So disclaimer, this is not a hologram. All you're going to see here sort of feels like this sort of 3D floating visual, but it's, it's not. It's mostly illusions. Um, this is a small uh, pepper's ghost. So what you see is a reflection of an image, but it's a reflection on, on, a, on a transparent foil. So you don't actually see the screen. It feels like it's floating. And then I use a Kinect to track the, the, the user, single user, and then I change the perspective as the, the, the person moves. And it feels like you have this thing sort of floating in the air. This is the slightly more high-tech version with Vive trackers, and um, transparent um, uh, uh, net for the projection. 
And then I was like, oh, this is so exciting. I could like control light in space. This is all I, I wanted to do for forever. So now I've sort of moved, I got rid of the Pepper's Ghost, got rid of the, the net, and then I use particles of water as a, a surface screen. And I use the same Kinect to sort of project. So there's me somewhere here and my sort of inverted shadow. So it sort of feels like there's a ghost in front of you and it's, it's you and it's like a mirror, but it's weird. So yeah, it's been uh, super exciting to prototype this. There was no purpose, no project, uh, until we, we decided to so, make one. So something that is very uh, important in Joanne's practice is to uh, publish a lot of what you do. It, it's, it's a really exciting uh, exercise to like, instead of just doing things for yourself, like to film and then put it in, in the world. and. When he was doing that for almost a year, I would get all these emails like, "What is, we want the installation, what is it? And I was like, that, that, we don't know what it is. Like, it's nothing yet, but it's, it looks very exciting. And we ended up developing this project called Brume. So it, it's still very much in the experimental, experimenting, because when, when you build like a new uh, intangible device, there's so much you can do and, and you want to, do complex things, but then when you present it to an audience, this shadow thing is the hit of the, like just seeing yourself big in a shadow and being, is it just works. And then you're like, okay, should we keep this? Should we make it more interesting? So we, we started like um, making Broom in a public space. So this was in 2017 where we uh, had the opportunity to show it uh, eight meters tall by eight meters wide. Um, this is me here somewhere. So that's the scale. It's like very much bigger than we can tell. It was in a big club party in, in Brussels in a, an abandoned warehouse. And then we, um, uh, last summer, we showed it in a very small black box. So it was also interesting to explore, okay, is the scale the core of, of the relationship to this intangible screen? And we realized, okay, it's like a different project, actually, when it's like massive scale and when it's more like human scale. So that's, that's uh, mini humans. Um, and recently, this, this project is super unrewarding because remember I told you about this back and forth, like the, the tech, the production, the content, the, the production, the content. And this project, because it involves water, nozzles, water pressure, when you think you finally understand it, then the next day nothing works. So it's so difficult to be able to focus on the content when you're actually just making sure the water pressure is steady. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I ha personally as a producer, I have a love-hate relationship with this project because yeah, of course it's amazing, but it, it, when are we going to like get to the next level. And same for Joanny, when he wants to focus on the content, but then you have the humidity in the room that starts breaking all your, hard, your hardware. Um, so in last May, we were able to show it in a massive, beautiful um, space in uh, Brussels. And we, we, we were finally able to test it 15 meters wide because we really wanted to see like, like the big, big scale of it. Uh, so yeah, that's me and that's the screen. Um, and when we got there, we got a really weird uh, opportunity to present this in a, in a crazy TV show. Um, so it was, a, a, it was an incredible experience and the perfect timing because we were ready to have it work 15 meters wide. And when you work in a TV show, TV environment, you, um, you have the pressure of presenting it to Will Smith and things have to work. Uh, like Will Smith is, is coming, they say like, shoot, and, and I mean, you can't fail, it, it has to work. And then you, you add this uh, Kinect uncertainty and, and you don't really know if they're gonna behave the way they should behave, if they're gonna be in the right area for the Kinect to see them. And of course the Kinect fails uh, on the top left, it's the first second when the, the installation starts and then it flickers and it disappears for like uh, 1.5 seconds. I counted, I was like, ah. 
and and luckily something happened and it came back in but yeah this all this work for just uh, three minutes of show was just insane i'm, I'm glad we don't do this as a living but uh, it was a, a it nice was, experience it was also a dream because when you get into the bbc studio in london you have 70 technicians which is like my dream come true and uh, i don't know you need gaffer tape and you just turn around and there's a guy putting gaffer tape everywhere with, i mean e everything just happens and you have this great energy of people who work together because it has to happen, it has to work, so you don't get into these fights of whose responsibility is it, and and yeah, it's... it's uh, so this is, when, when we get there, is this an art installation? Is like, no, of course it's entertainment, but it also brings a lot that we keep and that we are able to reinvest into what we do on the art scene. Uh, no, I think that's just it. I really was never expecting to see my sort of debug view mode with VVVV and with, with those guys uh, and, and the depths. And I'd say it, it's, uh, yeah, sometimes those uh, projects bring us to very uh, unexplored uh, uh, places. So it was, was, it was very nice. Uh, yeah, I'm glad we only do it like once every two or three years because it's a little... And, uh, and after that, Will Smith asked for our cell phone. So maybe to be continued. We don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, so there was a lot of different things, a lot of different projects, 10 years of, of practice. And uh, the most recent project, I guess, is called Constellation. And it's also on this idea of being able to um, play with light in, in space, to have uh, uh, in these projects, I'm exploring the, the geometry of the cosmos and, uh, and the, the scale of, uh, of the constellations. And it's like a, um, this, this sort of journey into uh, geometry and cosmos. And we brought this water screen in public space, uh, in, in big light festivals, and we're really, really lucky to be able to show the work to, uh, to thousands of people. Uh, this project is currently in Metz, in, in France, uh, and, for And again, it's, it's, um, this is a good example, again, of how it's not about the technology or the medium, but what you want to do with it and what you want to tell with it, because um, Constellation uses completely different hardware from Broom. The content is also completely different. The experience, this is an audiovisual show for a wide audience, family, kids. But um, the, the knowledge you get from experimenting with projecting on intangible devices allows you to create more content that works on water and on transparent screens. And um, so this project is yeah, currently in mass in France, and I think we're going to eat almost uh, one million visitors for, for this uh, one installation. So we, it feels like after 10 years of super hard work, we're finally getting into these big um, events and, and being shown to a wider, wider audience, which is really exciting and challenging. Uh, we have Fête des Lumières in France, where it's a lot of like flickering stuff on buildings, and luckily uh, cities like Metz, they actually bringing not uh, just a uh, uh, agencies, but also artists, uh, and that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very exciting for the years to come to see sort of small studios and independent artists being shown in such a huge um, scale, I would say. And for us, the, it's like the best uh, context to show this uh, piece because I don't know if you can tell from the video, but it's yeah. inside, it's, it's embedded in the river that is crossing the city, so there is no you are in a natural environment. You're in the, in the middle of the city, but you're on a, on, a, on a small island with a garden, and you just look at the river, and there is this image coming out of the river. And um, yeah, that, 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 would, that meant a lot to us. Cool, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
It's very challenging indeed. That's uh, often uh, one of the biggest challenges. Um, uh, so there's no ultimate solution. You'd have uh, so when you're lucky to do a project in organized by the city, you know it's going to be easier because they can hopefully talk with their technicians and people in charge of of the lighting, the public lighting. And just that alone can save you like 50 emails trying to understand who in this city has the key to turn that light off. And sometimes it's not possible for safety reasons. So then you get into sub conversations about how do we bring in lights uh, to sort of make it safe, but without the main horrible sodium light. So it's a long, un never ending battle to sort of, uh, yeah, try to have the least possible light. Um, and it's getting worse with, with the pollution and, and with the public lighting. Uh, it's getting worse and worse. So I hope one of my um, uh, fights in, in the coming years will be to maybe try to uh, work with cities to reduce light pollution, to optimize. Uh, I'm not even, I don't even know how to start, but I think it's really important that we get rid of non-LED lights in public space because it's a disaster in terms of energy consumption and it, it's bad for everything. You can't even see the stars at night. Well, in what world do we live that we sort of shield shielded ourselves to uh, so anyway so that's a very emotional uh, uh, topic I, for me i have two answers to this question um uh something that really played a big role in the um, creative process of joanie even in big installations and and big immersive environment uh was all the work he had to do uh to produce gallery pieces because when you're a private collector you don't want to live in the darkness so uh, I don't know if you saw the piece that we installed on the ground floor. And that's why um, for all this category of work, it's always very important to us to have a physical object. So when the projection is off, you have something pretty on the wall, including we've been producing a lot of screen-based work and, and, and we struggle to find uh, solutions to do direct print on screens so you don't end up with another black TV when your artwork is, is off. And um, it was very difficult at the beginning for Joanny when you've relied doing big video mappings, you've relied on the audio sync and the big wow effects and, and it's difficult to do uh, gallery works that have audio for the same reasons, like you don't want to live with this uh, loop going on and on and on. And, and when we started working together, uh, Joanny had drawn this wall between his uh, like installation, festival uh, projects and the gallery works. And with time, it, the, the wall disappeared and we are really all the time reinvesting what we learn from one side into the other. Second answer, something that is really cool about intangible project is that if there is a little bit of light, then it shows that your, your screen is transparent. If you show something like Brume or even Constellations in total darkness, you actually don't see that it's see-through. So, of course, I fight against this horrible public light that is going to be in the face of the audience, but it's also nice to like when we did it in this uh, big theater in Brussels, we had to actually put lights behind so we could reveal the architecture and show that we have these shapes floating mid-air, but you could see through. Um, I, um, I have a specialty in public space and you can't, I mean, e even in a conference room, uh, like you can't fight the reality of, of, of lights and uh, you just have to make it part of the work, I guess. Mm. And uh, that's a much more balanced uh, answer than <laughs> mine, thanks. Uh, also, one thing we don't realize, as a, I didn't realize as a light artist, was that sunlight is there, it's free, it's brighter than any projector you will ever get. Uh, so there's an opportunity maybe to uh, consider this light source as um, material for a, a project or an installation. So then you'd probably have to create darkness or maybe use mirrors to project on a, on a shaded uh, wall, but there's a lot I want to explore. Uh, instead of fighting the sun, just actually use it. And there is this really interesting project from uh, Kimchi and Chips called uh, Halo that plays with the light, the, the light of the sun and, and uh, mists. And uh, unfortunately, they've shown it only in London so far. So 
did not work that well. Um, but it's we love this project and we love the, what they want to do with it. Yeah, it's amazing. Next question. Hi. Um, judging from your social media, like many of us, you've gotten con uh, increasingly concerned about planetary collapse, the ecology, fighting with Autodesk. Um, how are you, so in a little bit more activist, how are you folding, have you thought about how you're folding that into your work or your aesthetic or your art or anything? Um, I don't know. Uh, it's, so long story short, I discovered just outside Brussels, the largest coal mine in Europe. I had no idea coal mine was still a thing and I think it was decaying, but it's actually growing. Uh, they're like, anyway, so I went there. I couldn't quite believe it, so I went there. Uh, with my drone and, uh, and and with some cameras to sort of see if this could be a good subject or topic. And I was so shocked by the devastation I saw there. Uh, they're actually raising uh, villages, uh, raising churches. The, the, it emits about uh, three tons of CO2 per second. It works 24-7. So anyway, it's when I, when I saw that, that I sort of woke up and realized the challenges we're facing. It means I didn't learn anything new. I sort of, we all know it's been 30 years. We know there are um, uh, uh, a climate collapse coming and some changes. We don't know when, but we know it's like ongoing. So now I'm, I feel rage about people supporting this mine, like Autodesk or BNP or you name it. It doesn't really matter. What, my rage is more about that uh, people with power and with money, they sort of cash in on, on this and they don't give a shit. And um, I really, I have no power, I can't, I can't do much, but at least I want to try. So, so Johnny will tell more about that in the panel that is happening at two in this same room with Julia and other people about this activism. Um, because this is so new at the moment, it's still like two separate worlds, what Johnny does an, as an activist and what we do as a studio. But nevertheless, like we know we want to do something in the studio with solar energy or the light of the sun. Um, Brum works perfectly if you turn on tap water and let it just like run through, but we don't want to waste water. So it's been such a struggle to make it like a closed circuit. Um, we try to ask people to turn things off when we have an installation running. So it's very small things, but it's, we of course we think about it and again, Production wise, we because we are not getting younger and we want to travel less, we've been working a lot in the past six years to um, make uh, installations that can be set up without us being present. So it, it means a lot of production work, like manual, it means like thinking about all possible scenarios and things that could go wrong. But reducing um, uh, flying is also very important to us. We talk with many artists about how we could be more like touring, like instead of going to Mexico, coming back, and a month later going to Buenos Aires, how about doing a South American tour, an Asian tour. Um, Recently, we've confirmed Constellation in uh, Liverpool, and they they made a budget for us to fly there, which is 35 euros both ways from Brussels to Liverpool. If you go by train, it's 400 euros. But now we make it part of the deal. Like, if you want us to come, we will come by train. We are sorry, it's expensive, but we have to make it change. So it's many it's it's a lot yeah. to keep in mind but uh, so it's very much improvised now but we that's something we want to sort of push and develop in the future and to sum up these are the individual actions we can take and i consider like what we do in the studio as like individual actions so we can have a tiny impact but it's very important also to target the the the, uh, the bigger uh, sources of co2 like uh, a uh, hundred um, companies are responsible for 70% of the CO2 emissions. So I think we should do both, the individual, but also we should wake up and do something all together to sort of uh, impact uh, the, the big emissions. And, and they're just down the road in the old port. I'll, I'll talk about it later. And we um, were so, so excited that um, an event like Mutech would uh, curate a panel about these topics. We're like, okay, yes, it's now is the time. So great. Let's talk about this all together. Uh, thank you for the great presentation and um, 
I saw some of your, your artwork, uh, like Fuji and Kaguya Himuna Bamboo scene in Japan. And I really like the, your approach, uh, like uh, uh, the visuals floating, like a photography for in, in the air. And uh, I understand the water screen has depth because it's mist, but uh, the transparent screen, do you have any like uh, multiple layers or one layer to make look 3D depth? It's actually just a single layer. And um, I, I have the ability, I have different types of screens, so more or less uh, deep. But actually, the trick is to have a thin layer, so your image can be sharp. If the screen is too deep, then it gets bl very blurry. So you want a thin layer, like a plane, and then you work on the content, uh, the image you project. Uh, you can use a bit of depth of field in the image you project. You need a lot of contrast. So there are this l list of tricks that you need to consider to bring depth. Um, and it's the same tricks I would use for um, Pepper's Ghost or for uh, when I project on transparent netting. Uh, it's this sort of expertise you develop in like creating images. So you play with the, the secret is the human depth cues. To perceive depths in, in reality, we use seven cues, seven things. Stereoscopy, two eyes, it's one of the cues. And there are like uh, six others, um, it's easy to find on Wikipedia. So I, I sort of work on each of these depth cues. So I sort of understand uh, visual perception for humans. And then I sort of play with this. Um, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a flat plane and it's mostly uh, tricks I use to make the image. Thank you. Maybe one more final question. Yeah, back there. Um, I'm interested, uh, being like a one-man show myself, how do you split up work between the producer and the artist? Like, What is the different fields? Who covers what? Um, so some of it is kind of easy, like anything that's going to be <laughs> pragmatic, down to earth, uh, the real world is going to be me. And uh, whatever is to do with the concept, the story, the dream, the, imp the, the thing that is not possible to make is more Joanie. Um, I have, I have an, 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 art, an art background, so I, 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 we also collaborate a lot on the, the content, the story, the, it, it depends. Uh, in some projects, I bring a lot of the story. In, in some others, uh, I don't. Um, as a producer, I cannot collaborate with an artist who's not interested in my uh, creative input. Um, yeah, and then there is a big uh, overlap though, zone, like the other way around. I, 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 I had to, but it was a big struggle to work with artists who would not consider the production and the real world and would, wouldn't want to hear about it. Like, um, um, when Joanny was part of Anti VJ, the roles were uh, rotating. So he would be the technical director on some project. He would be the creative lead on some others. And um, it's necessary when you want to make water screen work that uh, Joanny does also a lot of the production slash equipment uh, custom stuff. Um, and uh, next week we are going to uh, Iceland to start our first uh, collaborations together. We don't know um, if it's going to work. We don't know how it will look like, uh, but we want to sort of, uh, uh, for this specific project, we want to be both on, on both creative and production levels so we can have a, a richer experience, I guess. The fact that there's no, we don't have a deadline or a public showing is uh, helps to be a, a bit less stressed about it because when we're in when we are in uh, delivery modes, we have to be quick, we have to take shortcuts, and sometimes um, that, that could limit a little bit the conversation when we have to deliver like three projects in one week, we go like chak, chak, chak. So it's great that we have also uh, residency time to be able to sort of um, merge a little bit more the skills because uh, we both, I think, talented in, in both the creative and the production, and we want to take the most of these, those skills uh, to make new things. 
on Friday, I'm giving a masterclass about like really focused on production. And, and very often I, I give this masterclass to uh, emerging artists and people who cannot afford someone like me. So I tell them, okay, I'm telling you about expensive. production. So you know that on, on top of your work as an artist, you also have to do all of this. Um, and I think that's the, the reason why there are so many talented people with great ideas, great um, uh, skills to prototype or produce, but it doesn't go anywhere. It's because they miss this other head of like... The feasibility the, sometimes. Yeah, it's, the it's production. Very... And, and um, yeah, it's just something you have to do uh, to show your work to the world. Um, I think there was one more question. If I th yep. Make it fast. No. Um, so you mentioned you, were, you had an art background. I was just curious like, oh God, uh, what the backgrounds of you guys were. Um, for me, it, it, it's a long story short, but uh, my mom was um, uh, art, an artist and an art teacher when I was very young. And she was also uh, teaching computer, like DAO, Dessin Assisté par Ordinateur. So it's like Photoshop, but in 1985. Uh, so I sort of had a computer at home and I focused all my time and energy on like art and computer. And then I completely failed my A-level because I was doing like t-shirts and photography and video. So I sort of failed twice, but then got lucky to get into a, uh, a school in, in Nantes in France. And I learned a little bit more about programming and development, but it's mostly self-taught, I would say, uh, by practicing um, for, for my part. Um, I studied art uh, and marketing and art in public space, and uh, I was a artistic director for six years, and then I realized many years later that I, I had been producing things even when I was in school. Like I was the one uh, putting up a graphic design show in the gallery of the school. And, and I ended up in Montreal and working at uh, SAT, um, who's a venue where there's the exhibition of Mutec as well. And uh, I was there to do graphic design and I, I ended up being a um, um, project manager for three installations in public space and, and then, and then I met with Joanny, and he was the one telling me, oh, you know, people could pay for what you're doing. And I was like, it's really? I'm just helping out. And, um, and yeah, and uh, I, th I, I think it takes a little bit of everything I studied and did um, in my, um, like, interns and to, to do what I do today. But I don't think there is a, a specific back, back, like, studies or to, to get that. It, it, it's like Joanny always being good at um, learning softwares or learning material on his own. It's the same with what I do. It's, it's really a, more of a personality thing to, to know if, if, if you're good at it or not. Uh, also, I must add that uh, I didn't do any art studies, so I, so I was always sort of into that art, uh, sensitive to art, I guess. But I was accepted in uh, art school in France, but without my A-level, they, they didn't want me. Uh, I couldn't do it. So uh, there was a bit of frustration, and now I can tell the first five years of my practice, I was basically using plugins for After Effects and it was nice, but I had no sort of, I had no idea what I was doing. And it take another, it's taking another 10 years to actually understand better what's the essence, what essence in an artwork means. I mean, I always knew it, but now it start making sense. And I wonder if, he ha if I've done, if I've gone through like art, um, art school, maybe I would have skipped a few of those years of like trying to understand what the fuck I was doing. Mm. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you guys. Give him a round.